Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions. Hi, Max. How are you? Hi, Melanie. I'm fine. In fact, I'm preparing the coming holidays, and I want to have a car tour with my friends. That sounds lovely. How is your preparation? Well, I haven't begun yet because I'm not quite sure how to rent a car and what the expense is like, and something like this. Ha! <laughs> You've run into the right person. I did the same last holiday, and I can recommend it to you. I went to Avis Rent a Car Company, which is at 14A Dover Road, Oxford. Let me write it down. Is it D O V E R? Yes, and the telephone number is six three four zero nine six three. But if you book for the first time, dial another number with extension. That is six three four zero eight five three. Extension fifty four. Okay, thank you very much. I'll have a try. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions. Now listen to the conversation between Max and the assistant. Good morning, Avis Rent a Car Company. How can I help you? Hi, I want to book a car for tour. I want to inquire some information about the grade of the cars and the prices. No problem. We offer a wide selection of rental cars to choose from, from luxury car to economy car, compact car, minivan, and pickup truck. Well,、uh, luxury car is obviously out of my price range, but compact or economy is not big enough. You know, we have seven persons together. Well, how about a minivan? It's perfect for road trips and will make your journey feel like you're in a living room on wheels. I think that's good. Well, what does it feature? I, I mean, what facilities does it have? Unlike most minivans with manual transmission, the rental minivan cars have feature automatic transmission, air conditioning, and AM/FM stereo. If you drive a long, smooth way, you can use the cruise control, which will save you a lot of energy. Good. How much is the price? If you rent an intermediate one, it will cost you fifty-five pounds each day. If it is standard, the cost is forty-five pounds per day. I think the standard is enough. Oh, we have a special fifty percent discount for weekends from Friday to Sunday, but that doesn't apply to tax, recovery fees, and optional services. Well, what are the optional services? Well, they usually include some extra facilities like first aid kit or something like that.、Uh, I know. We plan to start off on Friday, so we have to prepare one day in advance. I want to book from thirtieth of April, which is Thursday. And it will end next Monday. Okay. Could you leave your name and the driving license number? My name is Max, and the license number is M nine zero two one. Okay. You can pick up the car on Thursday noon. Besides, we offer some optional services like street maps, flashlight, and sunsheet. What would you like to have?、Mm, flashlight is not necessary, I think. But street maps are useful, especially when we drive in a strange place. As for the sun sheet, I like to give that a miss. We don't want to spend too much extra money. Okay, Mr. Max. Thank you for calling. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a radio program on the process of making beer. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Hello and welcome to Gourmet Evening. And this week we're looking at the world's popular beverage, a great favourite today, beer. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Clark Maxwell. Beer is one of my personal favourite beverages, and I've got a number of facts, tips, and trivia about beer to share with you. So, who invented beer and when? What is beer made of? Actually, historians are not entirely sure when beer was invented, but they guess that beer was created accidentally by early nomadic tribes roughly ten thousand years ago. The four primary ingredients are malt, hops, yeast, and water. Malt, which gives the beer a sweet taste, is made from barley soaked in water until its husks open and sprout. The sprouts are then dried and crushed. The small flowers of the hops vine are added partly because they taste bitter, helping balance the sweetness of the malt. Hops prevent the growth of bacteria that can spoil beer. Yeast is responsible for fermentation, which creates the alcohol and carbonation. Beer makers sometimes use additives or substitutes for malt or hops. Substitutes such as corn or rice can make a beer lighter. Or cheaper to produce. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Adding fruit gives beer a fruity taste. Beer is not high in alcohol, as we know. The lowest type, light beer, contains no more than two percent alcohol, and the highest may reach six percent. Other drinks, such as wine, are more alcoholic. Wine contains eight to twenty percent alcohol, but that is not to say drinking beer is no danger at all. Like all alcoholic beverages, beer can make it difficult to drive and think clearly. Excessive drinking can also lead to liver damage, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers, and other health problems. However, beer also helps prevent some health problems when consumed in moderation. Beer contains a moderate number of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol can reduce the risk of heart disease. Beer also contains selenium, a mineral that promotes bone growth and helps reduce the risk of osteoporosis. I suppose many of you think beer can give you a beer belly, but you are mistaken. Genes determine how fat is deposited. No food or drink can create fat deposits in specific areas of the body. As with all foods, the more calories you consume, the more likely they are to be stored as fat and cause weight gain. Beer contains no fat and averages 150 calories per serving. Well, one more thing: pay attention to the storage and containers of beer. They will affect its taste. It's a mistake that the taste of beer improves with age, like that of some wines. Beer is a food product that will eventually become stale. It should be stored in a cool, dark location before consumption, and the color of a bottle can influence the flavor. Brown bottles block out light that reacts with the hops, which could damage the flavor. Green or clear bottles provide little or no protection from light damage. Do you know which country drinks the most beer? Although Britain is even on the list of big consumers, 
Actually, the Czech Republic consumes the most beer, at 156 liters per person per year, followed by Ireland and Germany. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between three students, David, Joseph, and Carrie. In the first part of the discussion, they will be talking about lounges in different school buildings on campus. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Hey Joseph, long time no see. How's it going? Oh hey David, it's going fine. I'm a little overwhelmed with all these new courses, but I'm hanging in there. Have you met my girlfriend Carrie? No. Hi, Carrie. Hi, David. Joseph told me about you. You two had quite the time last semester in European history, I hear. Yeah, we like to hang out after class. Now it's a little harder though. Lounges aren't as good as they were back there in Wilson Hall. Yeah, they had chairs, couches, and tables to put your stuff on. And that lounge was full. There must have been twenty-five seats in there. Really? The lounge in Jones Hall, where I have my communications course, only has about ten chairs. It's awful. We all just stand around or leave. I wish we could hang out more. Well, Agriculture Hall is next door. Their lounge is on the first floor, and it has couches. I think there are about six of them, and they're comfortable and hardly used at all. That's not a good idea. Thanks. But don't go to the lounge at Skidmore Hall. I don't even know why they call it a lounge. It's just four chairs in the corner of the main walkway. In the second part of the discussion, David, Joseph, and Carrie continue talking about conducting a survey. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Guys, we should really do something about those lounges. I mean, couldn't we gather signatures and try to get the university to improve some of the facilities? Yeah, that's a great idea. But we can't just say something random like, "Oh, you need to make the buildings nicer." We should come up with some kind of ranking system and have students rank buildings, how beautiful they are. How nice they are, etc. Well, if we were ranking on a scale of one to three, you all know that I would rank Skidmore Hall a one. Like I just said, that place is awful. No facilities. The bathrooms are way down in the basement. You're right, but they do have a nice balcony on the third floor. That might increase its value. But you shouldn't rank the architecture. You should rank how nice the building is for students to hang out in. 
Oh, okay. Then I agree with you. So should we do this? I think it's a great idea. But let's try it ourselves on a couple buildings so that we can work out any bugs in it. I think Wilson Hall is the best. Sure, but we've already begun. We will give a building one point if it has poor facilities, not enough chairs, and no vending machines. That kind of thing. And give a building two points if it is okay or acceptable. We can rank buildings that we really like as having three points. So, like Joseph said, I think Wilson Hall is the best. It should have three points for sure. And Skidmore has a one. Now, what other buildings should we rank? How about Merris Hall? No, they're not done with that one yet. But it looks like that will be a good place to hang out. How about Agriculture Hall? You said something about that hall a bit earlier. Oh yeah, they have that lounge with couches that no one uses. But that might indicate that people don't hang out there for other reasons. They don't have any drink machines. That's why I never go there. Oh, well then I think it's an average building. Let's give it the middle ranking. I agree. It could be improved slightly, but it's got a couple of nice features. I like that lounge in that third floor, for example, but the stairs are too short. I always trip when I'm walking up them. This ranking is getting complex. Okay, one building we haven't talked about is Canton Hall. What do you guys think of Canton? Is that next to the law building? Yep, it's got this excellent connecting corridor with chairs and desks to relax and work at. The cafeteria there is great too. I think that place is just as good as Wilson. Well, I've only been there once, and didn't know that was what it was called. It was kind of confusing, and it's kind of far for me to go, but I liked it, so I'll give it the middle ranking. Two points because it had nice facilities, but a poor and confusing layout. Oh, Joseph, you like Canton Hall? I hate that place. It's so mechanical, cold, and impersonal. The furniture is nice, sure. But it's the last place on campus I would go to. I give it a one. Interesting. Well, let's write this little survey up and start passing it around. I don't have time to type it up. Can you? Sure. I'll do it after my biology class. Should we meet up at Wilson tonight around eight? Sure. No problem. We'll see you then. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Lake Ackerman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding, unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire, and tsunami—the giant waves formed by major Earth movements. 
The story it tells is elemental. Without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About 590 million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometers across, and travelling at around 90,000 kilometers an hour, slammed into an area of red volcanic rock about 430 kilometers northwest of Adelaide. Within seconds, the meteorite vaporized in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about four kilometers deep and forty kilometers in diameter, and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise one hundred meter high tsunamis in a shallow sea three hundred kilometers away. Ancient, stable, and unglaciated, the bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Akraman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Akraman. Surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps, forty kilometers across, and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the centre of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern that experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact. Except for a crater which had long since eroded. The area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges, more than 300 kilometers east of Akraman. To his bewilderment. The volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Akraman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometers from Akraman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure: coarse pebbles at the bottom, then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea hundreds of kilometers away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Traveling at about three kilometers a second, shock waves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about two hundred meters within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Akraman. The arid, timeless Australian outback has preserved the closest thing the Earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.